This video shows you how to start up the Zeiss LSM 800 confocal microscope and use an air or oil immersion objective. Firstly, switch on the three wall plugs to the left of the microscope labelled Compressor, System and LSM 800. Whilst the microscope boots up, switch on the wall plug to the right of the system labelled Fluor Lamp and then switch on the HXP fluorescent lamp beneath it. Ensure that the adjacent three power supply boxes are all powered on and then, beneath the microscope, ensure the PSU power switches are on and that the LM laser key switch is turned to on. When the microscope has booted, the TFT screen will display the home page. To visualise your sample using the oculars, click the microscope tab button and then choose the light path page. By default, the light path is to the side port R scan head. Select the mirror that points the light in this direction and it will swap to pass the bright field light to the oculars. Press the home tab again and then on the right of the microscope press the third button on the focus knob mount. It is a flat button towards the rear of the mount and removes the laser safety interlock. To mount your sample, ensure the incubator top cover is opened and tilt the condenser arm back. Bring your sample in through one of the front incubator doors and mount on the stage, cover slip downwards and push the holder together to hold your sample. Bring the condenser arm forward and focus your sample. To swap to an oil immersion objective, under the microscope tab of the touchscreen, choose a suitable objective such as the 63X. The touchscreen will freeze and ask you to apply the immersion medium to your cover slip. Using the applicator attached to the lid of the oil bottle, collect a small drop of oil on the end and carefully apply a drop to the cover slip of your sample. Zeiss Immersol oil is classed as a skin irritant, so try to avoid contact with your hands. Remove with alcohol if necessary. Bring your sample to the stage and place the cover slip downwards above the oil immersion lens, pushing the holder together to clamp the slide in place. Bring the condenser arm forward and on the touch screen click done to move the objective back up to the approximate focal plane. Once you have the microscope all switched on and the LCD screen has completed its initialization, log into the computer, register with PPMS and then start the Zen program. Once Zen starts, select System and the microscope will initialize. At this point you will be asked to calibrate the stage. Please do so as this will improve accuracy in tiling experiments, but at this point make sure that no sample is on the stage and that there are no obstructions during the calibration. Once calibration is finished you will have access to the control of the microscope. Within the locate tab you have access to an overview of the light path and pre-configured favourite tabs for bright field imaging as well as fluorescence using DAPI, GFP and DS Red filter cubes. And finally, a control that switches off all of the lamps. On the right hand side, you have controls for changing lenses, controlling the microscope with the virtual joystick and focus control with a virtual focus slider. To begin with, I will start with GFP, ensuring that the light is directed towards the eyepieces, and I'll use the microscope controls to bring the sample into focus. Once you have your sample in focus, switch off illumination using the All Off button. You will notice that you can enable camera mode in the Locate tab. This will use the camera mounted on the right hand side of the microscope to display on the screen what you see on the eyepieces. Clicking Live activates the currently selected excitation and emission path, in this case GFP. Here we can see two water fluorescent pollen grains, which we are using as a test sample. You can move the stage around by double-clicking on the live image to centre on that point and also check the fine focus. Obviously you can still control the system via the hardware focus and joystick. It is up to your personal preference. Finally, we swap back to eyepieces and again switch the excitation light off to prevent bleaching your sample by using the All Off button. 
Once you're happy with the sample in view, move over onto the Acquisition tab, and this is where you set up the microscope for acquisition of digital images. The easiest way to do this is to use a smart setup to create an experimental design for yourself. Firstly, create a new experiment with a suitable name, and then use the smart setup tool to set the microscope up for acquisition of the fluorophores present in your sample. At this point you can select either LSM mode for standard confocal or Aeriescan super resolution. To begin with, select confocal and tell the system what fluorophores you are wanting to visualise using the plus button. In this case, we will tell the system we are looking at DAPI, Alexa 488, Alexa Fluor 568 and Alexa Fluor 647. Although the sample on the stage is not for us in pollen, this will set up the system as if we were wanting to visualise the four fluorophores, adapting the emission wavelengths as it thinks best for each. You now have the option of choosing different ways to image these fluorophores, with best signal working sequentially through each of the channels to optimise emission capture, fastest visualising multiple channels at the same time to minimise acquisition speed, but at the cost of increased crosstalk between fluorophore channels, and smartest which finds the best compromise between speed and signal. You will notice a representation of speed and crosstalk showing which channels are likely to interfere with each other, with crosstalk shown as negative bars on the graph. I will go with smartest here. You can pop out the toolbars and rearrange as you prefer. Here I have popped the channels tab out so we can see that and the rest of the acquisition parameters at the same time. You can see the system has been set up in three separate tracks with default laser powers and gain settings. 568, 488 singly using the 561 and 488 lasers respectively. And a third track with DAPI and 647 fluorophores, where both 405 and 640 nanometer lasers are on at the same time. Switching to track 2, the Alexa Fluor 488 is being directed to the first detector, and all signal from 410 to 560 is being collected. Track 3 is using detectors 1 and 3 to collect the DAPI and Alexa Fluor 647 signals respectively. Notice that as we are in line mode, to keep the speed of acquisition up, the dichroic sliders are left in the same position between tracks and lasers. Notice that as we are in line mode, to keep the speed of acquisition up, the dichroic sliders are left in the same positions between tracks, and the lasers are toggled on and off. This may not be completely ideal for your specific fluorophores. As you see, if I reduce the collected wavelengths on the DAPI channel, an effect is also seen as an increased wavelength range on detector 2, as seen in track 1. If I switch to frame mode, this will allow more specific alterations of dichroic sliders and pinhole diameters and accessory filters on a track-by-track -track basis, but at the cost of speed of acquisition due to the hardware changes required between tracks. This can be done in the Imaging Setup tab. If you open up the Imaging Setup tab, you can see how each track is organised on the sliding dichroic setup, which this microscope is using to direct signal to each of its three detectors. Detectors 1 and 3 are standard gas PMTs, and the second middle detector is the Aeriescan Array detector, which is operating in confocal mode. Here, the 568 channel is being directed to the middle detector, with the variable dichroic blocks assigning the emission between 560 and 620 nanometers to that detector. Although Smart Setup does a good job of configuring the microscope, there are some occasions where it makes some choices which may not be optimal for your sample. Looking at the way the smart setup has separated the channels, with DAPI and Alexa 647 using the two outer detectors, makes perfect sense as neither fluorophore is likely to bleed through into the other channel, despite both lasers being utilised at the same time. Track 1 looks fine with the sliding dichroic limiting the detecting range around that particular fluorophore quite well. However, 
The imaging of Alexa 488 on track 2 is set to use the first GASP detector, which can only be modified from the long wavelength side, which means you are collecting emitted fluorescence from 410 to 567 nanometers. If this was a real sample containing conjugated antibodies in DAPI rather than autofluorescent pollen grains, there is a possibility that the 488 excitation for this channel would pick up any autofluorescence in your sample, along with any potentially photoconverted DAPI. Therefore, it is useful to be able to tailor the emission parameters as accurately as possible. So using the central detector instead for Alexa 488 will allow us to alter the wavelength from both sides. It is usually good practice to not have your collection wavelengths overlap the excitation line wavelengths to reduce the chances of picking up reflections. But the laser blocking filters in the LSM 800 are extremely effective, apart from the one on the 647 laser, which is designed to allow some reflection to be detected. Once you are happy with the detection parameters on each of your tracks, you can either decide to set the pinhole to a, to a set diameter for all, or have it modified to one area unit for all channels, if you are using frame mode. This ensures the optical section is set the way you want for each channel. Now you are able to go live on your image, and a 512 by 512 pixel image will be visualised at high speed to allow you to fine tune the focus and set the desired laser intensity and gain settings. Looking at the live image, you cannot see anything on the screen in the image field. However, looking at the histogram underneath, you can see there is data being captured. Alter the lookup table is appropriate for visualising your data. But note that this is not altering your data, only the scaling on the monitor, allowing you to focus on an underexposed sample in order to avoid bleaching it. Live only captures a single track, so in this case only the green channel, as this is the currently highlighted track. In order to speed up acquisition, you can switch to bi-directional mode, but ensure your images don't show any zigzag lines. This is unlikely to happen, but there are controls to correct for it if it does. Slowing your scan speed or reducing your confocal zoom will also reduce this effect. Here, the image looks fine. The acquisition panel is also where you determine the size of each image. Live defaults to 512 by 512 pixels, no matter what you set in this panel. However, when querying an image via snap or start experiment, the settings you enter here will be captured. The continuous button will also use current settings. You can choose default frame sizes to change the pixel size across your image field of view, or you can use the confocal button, which will set the XY sampling at the theoretical resolution, which is known as Nyquist sampling. This is to set to the limit of the lens numerical aperture and wavelengths imaged. In this case, for the 20x lens on this system, a frame size of 2586 pixels squared is required for ideal sampling. Obviously, this will take a significant length of time to the image, even at faster scan speeds. So for the purpose of this training, I will reduce the sampling to 1024 by 1024, therefore reducing the resolution of the images captured. With that set, we can go live again and set the laser power and gain for each of the channels in turn. Using the histogram as a guide and increasing the amount of signal to increase the dynamic range of the data captured, whilst avoiding overexposing any regions of the image. You will notice that moving through focus will also affect the intensity, so ensure you are in the brightest focal plane for setting laser and gain, especially if you are aiming to do Z stacks. Ensuring I don't fill the histogram means that I also have dynamic range to play with in case other regions of the sample are brighter. Repeat this for each track, adjusting laser and gain to suit your final image. We won't go over experimental design here, but it should be obvious that you need to ensure your positive controls aren't saturated and that your negative controls are negative at the settings you use, and that once set, you should ensure all settings remain constant for all samples within an experiment. It is useful to use the range indicator to detail any regions which have no signal as shown in blue or overexposed as shown in red. Though be careful, as in some versions of Zen, the lookup table minima and maxima are applied to this indicator, so ensure you have the lookup table reset to full range. Usually, I switch the output to 16 bit mode to increase the gradation between black and white from 256 levels to 65,536. This does not increase the dynamic range, so overexposed pixels will still be overexposed in 16-bit mode. 
You often do see a decrease in the apparent underexposed signal, as shown by the reduction of the blue background, which is due to the larger dynamic range that data can be binned into from the detector. For track 3 here, you can see, if I go live, that you can see both channels at the same time. And using the histograms to estimate my required power settings, I can alter both channels to give me my desired exposure in the final image. The lookup tables for each channel can be altered individually by selecting their respective coloured bars above the histogram. And if desired, individual channels can be switched off from the display by clicking the channel name to the left of the histogram. Once set, I can proceed to take a snap image and all channels will be collected at the acquisition parameters set within the acquisition tab. Here I've popped the channel tab back into the settings to make viewing the image easier, but this isn't necessary. You can split the final image up into separate channels and check for any over or underexposed regions and adapt the imaging parameters accordingly for any channels which are not ideal. So here the 568 and 488 appear fine, maybe a little overexposed, with the 405 and 647 needing increased signal on this autofluorescent pollen sample. I'll adjust the laser powers and then run live again to check, using the histogram as my guide, and going through each track one at a time. Remember to check through the focal planes to ensure correct exposure throughout the sample. As you can see here when we look through the sample in the DAPA channel, it appeared ok at our previous focal point, but is overexposed near the outer focal range. If you are imaging several channels at the same time in one track, it is worthwhile switching off each laser in turn whilst imaging both channels to ensure that you are not getting any bleed through. In the case of this pollen sample, switching off the 405 laser not only loses a signal in the DAPI channel, but in the 647 channel. However, being an autofluorescent sample, this is not a concern. If you are looking at an experimental sample with multiple fluorophores, it would be better to alter the dichroic sliders or filters to better separate the tracks in the imaging setup. Or if that didn't work, as in this case here, split these two channels to be done sequentially rather than in parallel. This is easiest by going back to Smart Setup and selecting the best signal option rather than Smartest. Note though that if you apply changes in Smart Setup, you will need to reset the acquisition settings. For this training session to keep imaging faster, I will remove both the DAPI and 647 channels and concentrate on the 488 and 568 channels. Taking a quick snap image, you can see that although the signal intensity is ok, the image is a little grainy. This stems mostly from shot noise on the photomultiplier tubes. To improve image quality, open the Acquisition Mode tab and from here you can slow down the image scan speed. This increases the pixel dwell time allowing for a longer integration time and produces a cleaner image with better signal to noise. Using the View tab to switch to two container mode, Comparing the two images you can see the effect. A similar exposure is seen on the histogram, but a less grainy, better quality image is achieved at the sacrifice of longer imaging time.
An alternative way of achieving this would be to use the averaging option which scans the same pixel multiple times on a per line or per frame basis rather than imaging each pixel for longer in one pass. This can be less damaging to your fluorophore if it is prone to being photobleached, but is no good for any samples with movement in them as this will introduce blur since there is a significant gap between lines or frames. Of course, it is possible to form both at once to obtain a better image. The next imaging modality we will cover is taking a Z-Stack. Ticking the box will open up the Z-Stack tab, where you can modify the parameters for your experiment. There are two ways of setting up a stack, first and last, or center. If you know the depth of your sample, you can use center, focus to the midpoint of the focal plane, and press the center button to set this focal plane as the middle. Currently it is set at 4 microns. We can see on the position indicator that our sample here is too large if we focus through our sample. Increasing the depth to 25 microns is still not large enough if we scroll to the bottom. 50 micrometers, however, does capture the entire sample. Once you have set the range, you can alter the sectioning frequency. So changing the interval from 1 to 2 microns will halve the number of slices taken across the 50 micron range. In a similar way to the XY acquisition mode, where it, there is the option of manual frame sizes and a confocal setting where an optimal number of pixels is chosen to gain maximum resolution from the lens as determined by the numerical aperture of the lens. There is an optimal se setting for Z sections, which is determined not only by lens NA but also by the diameter of the pinhole. This optimal setting is approximately half the optical section depth as set by the pinhole, such that there is overlap between sections and no data is lost. Be careful when setting the Z interval so that banding is not seen in your final image due to undersampling. For speed here I will undersample and to save time I'll also remove the averaging parameters making the imaging as fast as possible. Imaging more than 2D requires using the start experiment button rather than snap. Here the video is speeded up. Once complete, you can scroll through the slices using the Z position slider beneath the image, where you can use one of the multi-dimension view options, such as Auto View or 3D Renderer, where you can free rotate the image. It can be useful to switch back to one container mode to give a larger view. As you can see, these aren't the best images, with some banding evident due to Z undersampling, which is expected given we deliberately reduced our data sampling. Going back to the Z-Stack tab and switching the first last mode, I can set the positions manually by going live and focusing through the image from top to bottom and setting the start and end points of the stack. This is often the easiest mode to set up for single images, whereas using center mode is best if you wanted to use multi-position imaging too.
and clicking the Z-Stack option, we will now move on to the tiles and positions capability of the system. So click on the tiles box. If I go back live onto my image, I can move around the stage either using the joystick or using the on-screen controls. Double clicking on the live image will recenter on the crosshair and clicking on the edge of the image will move the stage by half or a full field of view in that direction. There is also a virtual joystick in the right hand controls panel. In order to make imaging your sample more efficient, it is possible to utilise the option of confocal zoom to increase the magnification of your image so that you are not imaging the area around your sample. This is done in acquisition mode and is essentially the same as taking a one times image and cropping the resulting image. And whilst this does not gain you any resolution, it does have the benefits of reducing acquisition time and mean that you are not bleaching any cells around the one you are currently focused on. The confocal sampling button in the acquisition mode tab will adapt the number of pixels for optimal resolution depending on the numerical aperture of the lens and wavelength being imaged. This system is designed to provide the best images at one times by using the middle of the lens as this has the least aberration in the glass. However, you do have the option of using confocal zoom to zoom out to as much as half times which doubles your field of view without needing to change lenses. You can see this in the scan area tab. This facility is ideal for locating your sample and doing quick overview tiles but not advised for imaging. To perform a quick overview tile scan of the area surrounding the current field of view, activate the tiles option. In acquisition mode, ensure the field area is zoomed out to half x and drop the frame size to 512 by 512 with no averaging. Now in the tiles tab, choose the array size you would like to scan. 3 by 3 is default, which is what I'll use here. Click the plus button to add this 3 by 3 tiled area centered on the current field of view to the task list. It is possible to add multiple tiled areas by moving to other fields to use as a new centre and clicking plus will add these to the list of tracks. Pressing start experiment will now perform the list of tile scans with the fast wide field of view setup that we chose and in the selected channel which is Alexa Fluor 488 in this case. To take this overview scan will still take half a second per image which becomes slow for larger areas. There is however an alternative route using a secondary camera mounted on the system. If you return to Smart Setup, you will notice the current settings for two fluorophores on the confocal side. There is also the option of wide field imaging. And whilst you cannot combine both image modalities in your final image, it is possible to use this wide field option to carry out your preview image. I select Alexa 488 here, but it is also possible to use bright field imaging if you have enough contrast to see your sample that way. I'll colour this channel yellow for clarity. If you look back at your imaging setup now, you will notice that the wide field track is not selectable and going live still uses a scan head. If you go into the channels menu and deselect the confocal track, it will now allow you to select the wide field track. You can now utilise the camera in, on the system. Going back to imaging setup, you can see the system is now using the GFP filter cube and the HXP fluorescent light source. Going live, you can now see we need to decrease the exposure, in this case down to 25 milliseconds. It's a good idea to refocus at this stage as the camera and confocal scan head aren't completely parfocal, and then update the Z position of the tile region. In advanced setup of tiles, ensure that it is set to use the existing tile region and settings. Ensure the channel setting for the wide field track are correct and that the wide field track is selected in channels. Then, instead of using the start experiment button, use the start preview scan button at the bottom of the tile image window. As we cannot use confocal zoom and the camera field of view is smaller than that of the confocal, it will take more time to cover the same area. However, as you can see when we carry out the preview scan with the existing experimental wide field settings, it rapidly images the preview area.
the image quality, as you can see here, is poor, and the stitching isn't even particularly good. But the image does not necessarily have to be great, but merely act as a positional map. As you can see, if I now switch back to the confocal track, you can navigate around the preview image and move to the region of interest much more quickly than you would if manually searching around the sample. Clicking on the stage tool will bring up a field of view box and you can double click on the image to move to that point on the image, so recentering the stage onto that position. If you want to take an image at multiple positions within this tiled region, centre it on certain objects, then click on the Add Position buttons in the Tiles Positions tab. So now when you start the experiment it will move to the registered X, Y and Z positions. You may need to alter the Z for better focus, as the Add Positions button registers the current Z plane when you click it, whether or not you are in focus. Do this by using the Verify Positions button going live and adjusting focus as appropriate, before setting Z and moving to the next position. You will notice they all have slightly different Z planes now, which should give a more focused image. Going back to a 2 times zoom, so we are only imaging the cropped region, and starting the experiment, you can see the system goes between each of the set positions in all three axes and takes the images. You can scroll through the images using the scenes slider. The scenes that I file format will store the three images in one file. A more adaptable tiles and positions option is to use the advanced setup menu within the tiles tab. This will open a separate image tab which acts as a stage map. Rather than just adding a set tile, it is possible to draw a bespoke tile region using a tile region by contour. Then, rather than clicking Start Experiment, select the Start Preview Scan option. Again, it is useful to optimise your acquisition conditions for speed, etc. at this point, even just using a single channel. You can redo the scan if you need to capture more area by adding to the current image, or deleting the existing image if you click the tick box. This is a very powerful way to pre-scan entire tissue sections, then allowing you to draw a more accurate tile region for higher resolution imaging, and when going back to two container mode, can be used as a live map of the sample. This allows you to move around the tiled area and scan the fields of interest at a higher zoom or pixel density, or at better quality. An issue with large fields of view, especially as magnification increases, could well be flatness of your sample. Asking it to tile around the visible cells and avoid em excess empty space, a useful tool is to select support points, which will allow you to select different Z positions at different points across your tile region. You can add support points in a grid or at selected positions within a tile region. You can add support points in a grid or at selected positions within a tile region, and these appear as yellow target signs within the tile region. Each position needs its Z plane verifying. Do this by expanding the focus surface section of the tiles tab and click verify tiles region slash positions. Click move to current point to move to the first focus point 
go live and optimize the focal plane with the focus control. Click set Z and move to the next and repeat for each focus point, adapting focus as you did with the earlier positions. I've sped the video up here to save time. Click close when all are done. Now these will be used to extrapolate a surface map of the region to try and ensure you maintain focus across the sample. Once the positions are all verified you can choose the extrapolation method, though default is usually pretty good. Looking at the focus strategy, check it is set to use focus surface, then you can start the experiment. Looking at the focus position, you can see the Z position adapting as it scans the tile region. Once complete, you are left with the focus tile region of your sample. There are other methods of carrying out focus mapping, such as software autofocus, which will search for the highest contrast Z position within the set Z range and use that as a focal plane. This would be limited in this case, as it would have difficulty on regions where there is no sample, and therefore nothing to focus on. Definite focus, on the other hand, uses an infrared measurement of the bottom of the cover slip to determine whether your slide is at an angle, and adapts it as required. Start by getting in focus in part of your sample, then when you click Start Experiment, it will take a measurement of the Z position offset and use this throughout the tile region, checking every image before capturing. This can slow imaging, so you can reduce the frequency of sampling in the Expert Settings part of the menu. However, this strategy may not work if your sample is flat on the microscope slide and the cover slip is at an angle. This infrared measurement can also be useful if you are trying to find focal position on your sample where clicking Find Surface will locate the cover slip to bring you closer to the focal plane. As you can see here when I've defocused the image, the focus returns to near the focal plane if I activate the Find Surface option. It will not find the exact focal plane on its own, but will usually get you close enough to manually tweak it. In a similar way to being able to zoom out from the 1 to half x confocal zoom, to show the sample at the edge of the lens as you would do if you wanted to tile a large region, there is also the option to zoom into your sample. The physical resolution of your image is determined by the lens, but by zooming in and focusing on a specific area within the field of view, you can not only scan the area faster, but you also reduce the impact of bleaching on the surrounding area. If you were to image at maximum possible confocal resolution, as determined by the lens characteristics, then reducing the field view will reduce the number of pixels required. So a 3 times zoom will require one ninth as many pixels. This is easy to achieve using the confocal button. I will take a high quality confocal image of this pollen grain at maximum resolution in two colours, applying some averaging. If I now go back into Smart Setup and select the same 488 and 568 channels, but this time instead of using confocal, I select the option of Area Scan Super Resolution Imaging. Effectively, the controls are exactly the same with a slight difference being the AeriScan Detector Array uses a slightly different laser power and gain settings. I will set the acquisition to give a similar image to the confocal one that I've just completed. You will notice a hash beside the channel label, indicating that the image you are seeing is a sum image from each of the detectors. One difference with AeriScan is its doubling of the recommended pixel sampling, so you have the option of confocal, which is similar to using the gas detectors or the AeriScan Detector in non-AeriScan mode, or SR for super resolution mode, where the pixel sizes are halved. As we are limited to one detector and doubling of the pixel density, the images will take longer to acquire.
Not only is extra data being collected, but it is being reassigned where the fractionally different angles at which the light hits each of the detectors in the array is used to mathematically calculate extra resolution. You can also see a warning that area scan acquisition is not configured optimally. Hovering over this will explain why. In this case, for best resolution, the system suggests using the 63x lens rather than the 20x. It will also warn if your pixel sizes are too large for optimal acquisition and area scan calculation. However, the advantage of area scan over some of the other super resolution techniques is the ability to use any lens and fluorophore on live or fixed samples. You can see if you compare the confocal image we previously took with the sum channel, they look very similar. However, when the data is processed in the SR tab, you can see the increased resolution offered by Aeriscan compared to confocal. Due to the little structure, this particular sample is perhaps not the best example of the capabilities of Aeriscan, but moving to a higher magnification lens with better resolution, we should be able to image easily down to less than 200 nanometers. You will notice in the lower portion of the screen that there is a representation of the Aeriscan detector, indicating its calibration and alignment. This should auto-adjust, but you have the option of centering the image on the central detector using the sliders, whilst in live view if the calibrations are not optimal. One issue to be aware of with Aeriscan is that the file sizes are 30 times larger than normal confocal, even if acquiring the same pixel size, due to the image being collected from 32 detectors as opposed to one, so Aeriscan is not advised for general imaging. If you have taken an image, you can use a stage tool to recenter the microscope on specific areas, even if you haven't created a preview image or been using a tiles menu. This can be used in combination with the positions tool, which can be found within the tiles menu to allow you to set multiple positions across the sample. Going live, you can move between the positions by clicking on them in the table, and then update the Z positions for each new position in turn. Now, if you start an experiment, the system will take images with the set acquisition settings at each of the marked positions in with the X, Y and Z coordinates. This can be used in combination with the tile series function to allow you to mark specific samples and return to them on a time lapse, allowing you to track cellular functions in live samples. In the finalised image file, you can now move between the different positions, also known as scenes, and at different time points by moving the appropriate sliders. Obviously, to maintain physiological conditions suitable for your cells to grow, we need to ensure the microscope system maintains correct temperature and CO2 levels. These can be set on the incubation tab on the right-hand panel, with calibrated temperatures being taken for different components to keep your samples at 37 degrees and 5% CO2, for example. So be aware that the set points may need to be set different than what you would be requiring. Please discuss with us your imaging needs and we can help to enter the correct settings for your sample setup to ensure that your samples are imaged in physiologically appropriate conditions. We have temperature controls for the main incubator body, the heating unit XL, as well as a humidifier bottle and a heated 3cm dish holder, called insert P, as well as being able to set the CO2 concentration and bubbler fan speed. Once you are happy with the images you have collected and want to save them, 
Right click on the name of the file at the top of the image and select Save as CZI. If you navigate to the D data drive, within a user data folder you should see some month folders. Create yourself a named folder inside here and save your file to this directory. Once saved you'll notice the asterisk by the file name will disappear and the image can be closed. This will not only save the image but all of the image conditions for laser power, gain, lens, scaling etc within the metadata of the file so that you can refer to it at a later date. If you try to close an image which has not been saved, it will prompt you to save or discard. You can export images as JPEG or TIFF for presentation purposes, but in the first instance it is best to save the image in its original RAW format. Once you've saved the images you want to keep and are ready to end your imaging session, close the Zen program. You will notice a Zen service continues to run in the background for about 20 seconds or so. The PC will not shut down until it closes. If you wish to make a copy of your files immediately, navigate to the save folder you created and copy the directory to our RDW storage space which is mapped on this PC. If you navigate to central, then the LSM800 directory, a set of duplicate month folders have been created, so you can copy your images from the local data drive to there. But please, please ensure you use the same directory structure. For your convenience, this copying is carried out automatically in the early hours of the morning the next day. So unless you need your files the same day, you could just pick them up the next day. Often the image files can be large and slow to copy if you need to do it immediately. So keep this in mind when booking your imaging, so as not to run over into the next booking. The data is kept on our RDW space for one year to give you time to copy off the files to other storage and to offer some backup redundancy in the short term. Once you have completed your session, ensure you log off the PC correctly, such that PPMS tracker is closed correctly, and then proceed to shut down the microscope and PC if you are last user for the day. This video shows you how to shut down the LSM 800 confocal microscope and clean an oil immersion objective. Once you have finished imaging your sample, tilt the condenser arm back and carefully remove your sample from the stage. If you used an oil immersion lens, Take a single piece of lens tissue from the box and fold it in half. Use this to carefully wipe once across the objective lens to remove excess oil. Using a dry corner of the tissue, or a fresh clean one, wet it with ethanol from the supplied dropper bottle and once again wipe the objective lens to remove any residual oil. Finally, take a clean dry piece of lens tissue, fold it in half and wipe the lens to remove any alcohol residue. Wipe any spillages from the microscope stage. Now you can close down the software and hardware. Ensure all images are saved, then close Zen. A warning message will appear telling you Zen service is shutting down. Wait for this to close before logging off the PC. Switch off the HXP fluorescence lamp to the left of the monitor. Next, switch off the three wall plugs to the left of the microscope and close the incubator doors to protect the machine from dust.